The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And, uh, and that's, the thing that, that's the thing that keeps us going on, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's the belief that, that this is a, a moral universe we live in and that, and that we've got responsibility in our lifetimes to make it more just, make it more merciful. So um, thank you for that reflection. In our family, wrote Norman McLean, uh, the author of the novel A River Runs Through It, from whom I stole today's sermon title. Teaching, teaching title, teaching title. Um, in our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. And I relate. Uh, there's something about standing in a Michigan river, a cool water just over the knees of your, your waders, sun below the treetops casting a, a golden glow in the, in the river valley, the smell of the cedars, the call of a barred owl uh, breaking the, um, the monotonous sound of water rushing over rock. The dimple of a brook trout rising behind a boulder to take a mayfly off the surface. And a magic wand in your hand. Can I get an amen from the fly fishers? <laughs> amen. 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 For the rest of you, <laughs> the next 20 minutes might be a time to make your uh, shopping list. Uh, Plan out your week. Think back over the elections and where you're happy and where you're sad. Because I've always wanted to deliver a talk. I've longed to deliver a talk on the spiritual nature of water, especially the spiritual nature of, of rivers. And you are the fortunate few <laughs> who get the benefit from my obsession. So I recall a solo hike on the Appalachian Trail in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Um, my hiking buddy, our son, uh, had abandoned me to start a new life in sunny Southern California. Uh, the first two days of the hike were appropriately rainy and cold. And my spirit reflected the, the gloom around me. But by day three, the, the sun came out and the path ahead brightened. And I began to think that maybe there was life beyond Damien moving away to California. My route had taken me uh, to a camping site on a Big Creek in the eastern uh, edge of uh, the Great Smoky National Park. Um, after I set up camp, I, I assembled my, my pack rod and I, and I headed down to the river. Uh, working my way upstream uh, along the stony edge, uh, um, I, I came to a, um, a deep pool that formed beneath a, uh, a, a massive boulder the size of a, of a Volkswagen. Carefully, I, I picked my way up on the rock so that I could look down into the water. What I remember was the sun sparkling on the surface, a little rainbow where the cascading water kicked up a, a spray. Now, the gin-clear depth of the river where every stone on the bottom was, was magnified. A half a dozen trout suspended in the, in the water column. The warmth of the sun. The rock. I don't recall if I caught fish. I don't even remember casting. What is clear in my memory was that water and sun and rock and trout worked a healing miracle in my lonely life. 
In Herman Hesse's great novel, Siddhartha, the protagonist returns to the river. He looked lovingly into the flowing water, into the transparent green, into the crystal lines of its wonderful design. He saw bright pearls rise from its depths, bubbles swimming on the mirror, sky blue reflected in them. The river looked at him with a thousand eyes, green, white, crystal, sky blue. How he loved this river, how it enchanted him, how grateful he was to it. In his heart, he heard the newly awakened voice speak, and it said to him, love this river, stay by it, learn from it. I'm going to return in a bit to Siddhartha, for this is really only the beginning of the lessons that that he will learn from the river. We think of water um, in its uh, recreational uses, as we talked about this morning in the ch- in the children's um, teaching time. Think about its recreational uses. It's uh, we swim in it, we boat on it, or we we fish in it, uh, or, or we simply lie on on great expanses of of of, of white uh, sugar sand beside it. Indeed, the the Great Lakes states uh, benefit from a $9 billion annual water tourism um, industry. We think of water also in its its utilitarian uses. We drink it. We wash our face in it. Uh, in In fact, we can last, I'm told, no longer than 100 hours without water before our body begins to shut down and we move toward death. We've seen how fragile water can be. The children of Flint will grow up with significant cognitive deficit and and physical impairment because they were drinking poisoned water. The people of Toledo were without municipal water for four days when blue-green algae bloom in the uh, Lake Erie clogged the water intake pipes at their water treatment plant. We think of water also as a mode of transportation. Uh, freighters on the Great Lakes uh, uh, alone, I learned by Googling, carry 80 million tons of cargo every year, keeping an economy going in the Great Lakes. There's commercial fishing for lake perch and whitefish and lake trout. All those are are uses of water. But but what of the the spiritual nature of water? Well, let's let's start with its uh, symbolism. Water plays an important role in in religious traditions. Uh, uh, God parted the water for the Hebrew uh, people escaping Egypt and then closed it back again over their uh, assailants, the Egyptians. Moses touched the rock with his staff out in the, in the brutal, barren, arid wilderness, and water gushed forth. Water, in both cases, was seen as a sign of the power and the providence of the Almighty, a promise kept, a hope restored. The river Styx in Greek mythology, the river Jordan in the Abrahamic faith traditions, uh, the Ganges River in Hindu tradition, the Yol River of Norse, myth- Norse uh, mythology, all separated the living from the dead. The life of, of toil and pain and suffering from the Elysian fields, from the promised land. Crossing was difficult, but the joy of eternal rest lay beyond on the other side, on the other shore. Rivers as symbols. In fact, the 
The symbolism of the Christian baptism, I think, is profound, going down into the water where the baptized die with Christ to be raised with him, cleansed and forgiven. I, I trust that no one literally dies when they're baptized. Uh, it's a symbolic act, and the medium is water. Uh, my blessed mother was a, a Southern Baptist from Alabama, and to her dying day, she remembered the experience of being fully immersed in the waters of the Sipsi River. Um, I was baptized at East Congregational Church in Grand Rapids as a 14-year-old, and I vividly remember the Reverend Herbert Studebaker filling his giant palm with water that ran down my head and over my collar and changed my life. Powerful as, as symbol is, and, and we all know how powerful symbols can be. It still doesn't do justice to the full meaning of water as a spiritual medium. So think of this. We come into the world from a watery nest in the womb of our mother. Water washes us into the world. Our body consists of water. Science tells us that 60% of our body is water. We come from water. We are water. And we go to water. When John of Revelation wanted to show a vision for a future life in the new heaven and the new earth, he wrote, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. And the, the Genesis creation myth reminds us that out of chaos came water. And out of water came everything else that is. Evolutionary biology confirms that. Uh, confirms that life emerged first from water. Simple single-cell organisms formed out of water and then evolved into ever more complex life forms. When that biological evolution reached a certain stage, some of those complex forms came out of the water and lived on the land and became even more complex. And at a later stage, in that evolutionary development, those complex land-living organisms stood up and began to use tools and began to develop uh, self-awareness. But it all started with water. And the stamp of water is still on us and in us. Another hike. This one uh, on the Pictured Rocks Trail from Munising to Grand Marais. The day ended at, at Chapel Beach, a uh, campsite on the shore of Lake Superior. I suspect that there are some in here this morning that have uh, camped at Chapel Beach. Um, I made camp and I ate my dinner and I wandered over to the edge of a little bluff that looked out over uh, the lake, that, that is Lake Superior. Uh, the evening was coming on and, and dark rain-filled Clouds, uh, uh, rank on rank, came across the sky from west to east. The water was crashing on the rocks beneath me as the waves rolled in one after another. I was, I was tired, I, I, I'm certain, um, from a day of hiking up and down ridges and tripping over rocks and, and roots. Um, so it was easy as I sat there to enter a uh, a trance-like state, although I was fully aware of my environment. And I came to, to see in those moments uh, that there was water above me and that there was water beneath me and that there was water within me and that it's one water. It's all the same water. And that I 
was one with the sky and with the lake. A child of the universe. And I was at peace. Let me return then to uh, Siddhartha, who under the tutelage of the ancient ferryman uh, Vasudeva learns another lesson from the river. He took Siddhartha's hand and led him to the seat on the river bank, sat down beside him and smiled at the river. You have heard it laugh, he said, but you have not heard everything. Let us listen. You will hear more. They listened. The many-voiced song of the river echoed softly. Siddhartha looked into the river and he saw many pictures flowing by in the water. He saw his father lonely, mourning for his son. He saw himself lonely, also with the bonds of longing for a faraway son. He saw his son also lonely, the boy eagerly advancing along the burning paths of life's desire. The river's voice was sorrowful. It sang with yearning and sadness, flowing toward its goal. Listen better, whispered Vasudeva. Siddhartha tried to listen better. The picture of his father, his own picture, the picture of his son, all flowed together into each other, they all became part of the river. It was the goal of all of them, yearning, desiring, suffering, and the river's voice was full of longing, full of smarting woe, full of insatiable desire. The river flowed on toward its goal. Siddhartha saw the river hasten. All the waves and water hastened, suffering, towards the goals, many goals, to the waterfall, to the sea, to the current, to the ocean, and all goals were reached, and each one was succeeded by another. The water changed to vapor and rose and became rain and came down again, became spring and brook and river, changed anew, flowed anew. But the yearning voice had altered. It still echoed sorrowfully, searchingly, but other voices accompanied it. Voices of pleasure and sorrow, good and evil voices, laughing and lamenting voices, hundreds of voices, thousands of voices. He was now listening intently, completely absorbed, quite empty, taking in everything. He could no longer distinguish the different voices, the merry voice from the weeping voice, the childish voice from the manly voice. They all belonged to each other. The lament of those who yearn, the laughter of the wise, the cry of indignation and the groan of the dying. They were all interwoven and interlocked, entwined in a thousand ways. And all the voices, all the goals, all the yearnings, all the sorrows, all the pleasures, all the good and evil, all of them together was the world. All of them together was the stream of events, the music of life. Then the great song of a thousand voices consisted of one word, own perfection. Water is the spiritual element that binds us together. Binds us with nature and with one another. Water is life. If we come from water and we consist of water, then water is our common bond. Distinctions of race and gender, age and ability, they all vanish, submerged in the waters of life. Water also binds the past to the present and to the future. All the water that will ever be came into being 
in a single cosmic event at the beginning of time. No more water has been made. Neither has any water been lost. It just changes shapes and locales. Sit beside a river and watch it flow. Our Muskegon River, where Susan and I live now, um, yesterday was flowing at 2,600 CFS. That is 2,600 cubic feet per second. And that's pretty average for this time of year. But it's been flowing since the glaciers melted. And it flowed somewhere else before the glaciers. And it will flow long after I am gone, long after you are gone, long after uh, human life no longer exists on earth. Indigenous peoples think of rivers as the circulatory system of Mother Earth. Her, her life juices flow and flow and flow, and sometimes they evaporate and they rise and form clouds and then they return refreshing water to the earth and to the rivers and sometimes they freeze and wait for the warmth of spring to allow them to flow and flow and flow. The water ceremony in the Ojibwe tradition uh, is a blessing of the waters a purification by, by means of water, a recognition of our need for water and our responsibility to protect the water. There are water walkers, Ojibwe, Chippewa, women, elders, who walk around the Great Lakes offering the water ceremony, blessing the waters. Only women may offer the blessing of the water ceremony. Perhaps that's because those who nurture life in the waters of their bodies, who usher life into the world, are the only ones pure enough, close enough to Mother Earth to offer the blessing. And so as I conclude today, I'm going to invite Susan and Leslie and Ava to offer the Ojibwe water blessing. We've brought sacred water, holy water, from our Muskegon River here. Um, it's covered at, at the moment by an eagle wing that was a, a, a ceremonial gift to me and Susan when our home was, was blessed by, a, um, uh, by an Odawa uh, friend. Um, and so, Susan and Leslie and Ava, if I can invite you up to offer the Ojibwe water blessing. As I receive this water and it flows through me, may it become medicine, dispelling all ills. May it become medicine, revealing the wisdom within and throughout. I offer apology for any harm done through wrong speech and action.
as this water flows through me and becomes vapor, may it purify the atmosphere. May it nourish the wisdom potential in the people. I offer apology for any harm done through wrong speech and action. As this water flows through me and returns to the water table, may it remove the impurities of chemicals placed within the water. May the water be made new again. May this water become medicine for all beings in this and all worlds. Thank you for this gift of life. Thank you for the gift of water. We appreciate this water that you have given. Now the earth is dry and the trees are crying. Please accept our offering of this water. Please accept our apology for any harm done through wrong speech and action. 